Hello, Mr. Haros, and hello, people of Kensai. I'm Maggie Gunderson. I'm the president and founder of Fairwinds Associates and the founding director of Fairwinds Energy Education Nonprofit. I'm here today with Arnie Gunderson, my husband and chief engineer for Fairwinds Associates. We're here today to talk to you about the triple meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi. We hope to answer all your questions. I wish we could have joined you in person, but I thank you for watching this video and please uh, send us any follow-up questions. We'll be happy to answer them. Now let's bring Arnie into this conversation. Arnie, how dangerous is the situation now at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4, particularly in Japan with its continuous danger of earthquakes and seismic, seismic activity and chance for an additional tsunami? Unit 4 it has always been my biggest concern. If you watched our website on the very first week of the accident, I was saying that if Unit 4 were to catch fire, you'd have to evacuate Tokyo. As a matter of fact, the book that we wrote talks about that a lot. It's really important and it remains the biggest concern that I have about the Fukushima site. Unit 4 has more fuel in it than any of the other units in, in the uh, complex. But more importantly, it has the most recently used nuclear fuel. And all of that fuel is outside of the containment. So that would make it dangerous enough, except that also, of course, Unit 4 has had a series of explosions and is weakened structurally. Before, it might have withstood a 7-5 earthquake. I believe that the structural damage to Unit 4 is so great that if there is a 7-5 earthquake, it won't withstand it. Here's what would happen if Unit 4 were to crack and the water were to drain out of the nuclear fuel pool. The fuel is hot enough that it needs to be water cooled. And if air is all there is cooling the, the fuel, it will burn. It will burn the zircaloy cladding on the fuel, will react with the oxygen to create a fire. And it's a fire that once it starts, can't be put out by water. Water would make it worse. So the nuclear fuel would have to burn completely before the fire would ever go out. Now in the process, all that radiation would go up into the atmosphere and blow all over Japan and all over the world. There's as much cesium in the fuel pool at Unit 4 as there was in all of the atomic bombs dropped in all of the tests in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, and into the 1970s. All of the above ground testing has less cesium in it than is in the reactor pool at Fukushima 4 right now. So it's a grave situation and I don't believe that the Japanese government is moving fast enough. If there's no earthquake, the plan to remove the fuel slowly is going to be adequate. But we can't wait on Mother Nature. We have to quickly move that fuel out of that pool and onto the ground. The key here is quickly. The Japanese government finally, just this month, came up with a plan to build a building around the fuel pool building and begin removing the fuel in 2013 or 2014. Well, I said that that's what they needed to do on the Fairwind site in an interview with Chris Martinson a year ago. These things have been evident but TEPCO is not moving fast enough and the Japanese government isn't pushing TEPCO to move fast enough either. I think the top priority of TEPCO and the top priority of the Japanese government should be to 
move that fuel out of that pool just as quickly as possible. And in the meantime, they need to strengthen that pool to make sure that it can withstand an earthquake. Remember, that pool is not in a containment. You can look down in a satellite and see the nuclear fuel. The roof is blown off. And that's what makes it dangerous. In America, we had the Brookhaven National Laboratory do a study to examine what would happen in a fuel pool fire. And the Brookhaven National Labs determined that there would be 187,000 people would develop cancer from a fuel pool fire. It's a serious concern. And I don't believe that Tokyo Electric and I don't believe that the Japanese government is taking it seriously enough. For the last year, I've been working with Akio Matsumura. And finally, it appears that the world community is listening to Akio Matsumura's concerns about the pool. We need to tackle this as a concerned world community and encourage the Japanese government and encourage Tokyo Electric to solve it quickly. Arnie, you mentioned cesium in your early discussion. Why is it important? What's the health effect of cesium? And are there any other radioactive isotopes that would have been released during the triple meltdown? Cesium is one of many radioactive isotopes that are created in a nuclear reactor. It's got a 30-year half-life, which means it hangs around for 300 years. And biologically, it mimics potassium. Now, you might remember if you have a muscle cramp, you eat a banana and, the, and it goes to your muscles and relieves the cramp. Well, cesium also goes to your muscles. It's called a muscle seeker. And when it goes to your muscles, it can cause cancer, but it can also cause a variety of other illnesses. The Brookhaven study only looks at cancer. It doesn't look at all the other things that radioactive cesium can do. In young children with rapidly developing muscles, and especially their heart muscle, it can create something called Chernobyl heart, which is damage to the heart muscle, which once it's damaged, never ever recovers for the life of the child. So cesium is just one of many isotopes, but it is um, relatively easy to measure and also biologically causes almost the most damage of any of the other isotopes that are in that reactor. Arnie, you've said that you believe the explosion at Unit 3 was a prompt criticality. What is a prompt criticality and why do you believe that? I developed the, the, my concern about a prompt criticality uh, because of the nature of the explosion in Unit 3. Unit 1, when it exploded, blew sideways and re with relatively low energy. You can measure the rate at which it moves, and it moved less than the speed of sound. And that's called a deflagration. It doesn't do anywhere near as much damage. When I looked at the explosion on Unit 3, however, it was entirely different. You can see it. It's not hard to see. It's called a detonation. The speed at which Unit 3 exploded was faster than the speed of sound. And the important thing is not how Unit 3 exploded. What's the most important thing is that it exploded with a detonation, not a deflagration. The nuclear industry is not paying attention to this now, but it should be because a nuclear containment can handle the slow-moving deflagration, but it can't handle the fast-moving detonation. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the international community are absolutely ignoring the fact that a detonation occurred in Unit, in unit 3. Well, how did a detonation occur? That was the question I asked myself. I checked with chemists, and atmospheric pressure and hydrogen will not create a detonation. Like on Unit 1, it will only create a deflagration. So I needed to figure out how a detonation could occur. But there's a couple other clues here. 
one clue is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, way back in March of last year, wrote a report that's on our website that talks about nuclear fuel being deposited on the site and nuclear fuel being discovered as far away as two kilometers. How can nuclear fuel get blown out of the nuclear reactor? The fuel that's inside the reactor is also inside a containment. And there's no indication of a massive containment failure and a massive reactor failure that could have thrown the nuclear fuel out. So I had to come up with a reason that the nuclear fuel could have been released in pieces, not little fine atoms, but in pieces, which is what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says was discovered. The only way that could happen is if the explosion occurred in the nuclear fuel pool at Unit 3. Now, if you look at the video of Unit 3, the very first frame showed the explosion occurring on the side of the building. And that's the side of the building that has the nuclear fuel pool. It started on the nuclear fuel pool side and then worked its way up into the massive cloud that you see. So what could have caused that? That's the question. Hydrogen would have been above the nuclear fuel. It would have been a gas above the nuclear fuel, and if it exploded, it would have pushed the nuclear fuel down. That's not what happened. Remember, we have fuel fragments found off-site. Something had to lift the nuclear fuel up. Well, the only thing I could determine was that it was a criticality in the fuel pool that caused the fuel to lift up. Now, I built, the division I ran built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors exactly like Fukushima. And the dense fuel racks that are now in every reactor everywhere are uh, very close to becoming critical anyway. And in the accident situation where there was a seismic event and explosions occurring, it's likely that they were very near to becoming critical. And what that means is that they were very near to becoming a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. Now, way back in college, 40 years ago, we watched a movie called The Borax Experiment. And you can find it on the web today. And the explosion at Borax was a prompt, moderated criticality. It looks almost exactly like the explosion in Fukushima Unit 3. So um, an image I had from 40 years ago led me to conclude that the same thing happened in Unit 3, that a criticality occurred in the fuel pool, and it pushed some of the nuclear fuel up into pellets, and the pellets wound up scattered around the site. Now, the, the criticality is called prompt moderated criticality. It's not a bomb. A bomb is a prompt fast criticality. This reaction occurs slower than a bomb, but faster than what occurs inside a nuclear reactor. And the borax experiments were designed to test just how violent that reaction could be. And I think if you look at borax and you compare it to Fukushima Unit 3, you'll see there's an awful lot of similarities. Again, this is a theory, but it's the only theory that accounts for the explosion occurring on the side where the, where the fuel pool is. And it only, it's the only theory that creates the uplift force that caused the fuel particles to be uh, thrown about the site and discovered as far as two kilometers away. Well, there's one more piece of evidence, and that's that the, um, the roof over the fuel pool has been totally destroyed, whereas the roof over the nuclear reactor and the containment collapsed downward. We talk about that in a video on the site as well, and I think that's another important indication that whatever it was that caused the fuel to lift occurred on the fuel pool side of the building and not in the middle where the nuclear reactor was. Now, um, the, the